Good afternoon. This is Guillermo Sabatier, uh, your host for today. I am the Director of International Services for HSI, the Health and Safety Institute, Industrial Skills. And on today's show, Perspectives on Energy, we'll be talking about the European energy crisis and how that was a near miss. But is it really over? We'll talk more about this on the show. Welcome back. And uh, as I'm sure most of you may already be aware, you know, that Europe is right now undergoing a winter that isn't as cold as everybody had feared. So generally, they got really, really lucky. Right? Um, they definitely avoided an energy collapse. Uh, for the most part, they had a, a lot of challenges coming up, of course, you know, with the uh, Ukraine uh the war in the Ukraine and and and, and the Russian aggression out there. You're you're looking at the uh the cutting of uh, gas supplies to Europe. So as you can imagine, you know, that of course had an impact on the energy supplies and of course electrical supplies for the season for most of Europe. Uh, now, mind you, uh, some of the Russian gas is still flowing to other other parts of Europe, and uh, namely, you know, some certain other nations. But definitely, they have felt the pinch. Um, more, more importantly, the fact is that uh, a lot of their a lot of their fleet ran on natural gas. So a lot of those combustion turbines, combined cycle plants, all use natural gas, and of course, any other. Uh, conventional unit that once burned oil or coal had been gasified and then they were running natural gas you know as, as the transition fuel before they went into renewables um, not to mention the fact that Europe on its own had quite uh, had moved very aggressively towards those um, renewable goals and, and and to limit their 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 carbon footprint but at the same time you know they they did what pretty much every other utility does whenever they have access to gas is that they they uh, rely mostly on that resource it's a plentiful it's easy to manage it's relatively clean uh, or the cleanest of all the other fossil fuels and it's quite easy to to convert uh, these these older units to be able to burn natural gas it's very 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 um, beneficial to do this right problem is that now you're relying on a single source of fuel that's piped in and uh, that in itself presents a lot of problems, specifically reliability problems. So uh, going into this crisis, right, uh, and, and we've seen this all throughout the world as well, uh, They, uh, a large part of uh, Germany, for example, had, had shut down its entire uh, coal fleet and they, and they shut down all of the nuclear uh, generators. So now they're relying on renewables, whether it's solar or wind. And a large part of that, I think, is nearly half of their fleet ran on natural gas. But it's not just the generation of electricity. Um, Europe is heavily dependent on natural gas for heating, which is part of the problem that they were going to be facing this winter. Uh, had the, had the, the temperatures plummeted as, as everybody had feared, that there would have been a serious issue and perhaps you know some, some loss of, a lot more loss of life, given the fact that there would have been no, no energy to, to heat their homes, heat their businesses. Uh, the other challenge, of course, was uh, maintaining the uh, industrial temple, right? In in most of Europe, uh, there were there were issues where they were rationing uh, power in some cases, right? And and a lot of those were voluntary, but um, you, with a lot of government assistance and bailouts and subsidies, you know, they were able to make it through. So this, on its own. You know, they may have avoided this crisis, right? They avoided an energy collapse. So just last weekend, Europe was on the on the verge of ro doing rotating blackouts, meaning that the, they'll, they'll basically cut off some customers, uh, open up the feeders to out of certain substations, and then they'll rotate through those throughout the peak of the day or the morning or the night, depending on what they need in order to uh, not not have their grid collapse, right? Because simply when they when their their demand, is greater than their available, you know, generation, or when their load doesn't meet demand, you know, there's no balance on there, and then they have to, one way or another, they have to balance that, either by uh, bringing on more generation, buying more power, or just reducing that load overall. And as seen in this case, the only option they had left was uh, load reduction. Now, granted, um, fortunately, they had warmer weather, and they didn't run into that crisis yet. 
but as we can imagine, right, there's been a lot of aspects here. So uh, where did they where did they get most of the gas uh, now that, that Russia wasn't supplying it? And uh, a lot of that came from the U.S. in a form of uh, liquefied natural gas, LNG, which on its own is is way more expensive than the gas that was being piped in from, from Russia. And, of course, the only way that gets there is through shipping. Uh, that, that fuel has to be uh, liquefied, brought over, and then, of course, there's a whole other process of refining it. And that's all very carbon intensive and it, it very emissions intensive. And not to mention the fact that it is expensive, really expensive uh, compared to natural gas. So that on its own, you know, it's going to set them back on their climate goals. Uh, but at least they have been able to store uh, a lot of this uh, this fuel uh, to get them through the winter. Will it be enough? Uh, we shall see. And uh, all of them have said that that's going to be close. The crisis is not over. And they're definitely... Uh, uh, hanging on down the edge of their seats, given what's happening here. So uh, what else is complicating the situation over there, right? Uh, naturally, uh, it's they're buying which they can get. Of course, a lot of the uh, a lot of the cost is being offset by subsidies. So these subsidies, uh, whether it's a government bailout or uh, uh, in some cases, Germany, for example, uh, these bailouts constituted almost 7% of their GDP. That is considerable for a country like Germany. Um, and other countries out there are are still within single digits of their GD, GDP when it comes to these uh, government bailouts. But ultimately, this will not be sustainable. Uh, hopefully, this this uh, armed conflict will come to an end, and hopefully, they'll be able to buy fuel once again from Russia. But this is a clear warning and a lesson learned of relying. On, on on a nation state that isn't always the friendliest when it comes to political e issues. Um, this also points out the other challenge, right? Uh, when it comes to portfolio diversity, if you, too much of your fleet is reliant on one single type of fuel, right? Uh, they got lucky. They were able to like uh, use uh, LNG and in place of their uh, natural gas. Mind you, that wasn't a seamless transition. That probably has quite a bit of tweaking to get done at the plants to make that work. And I'm sure that has an issue on the maintenance cycle for all of those uh, all those different units. But that being said, they're able to keep the lights on. Right? Um, ultimately, that, that, that is going to present a, a problem uh, down the road when it comes to maintenance issues or breakdowns or even overhauls. And that may accelerate that cycle, forcing those outages a lot sooner. The other challenge that they're facing, of course, is the fact that um, they, they've had to bring some of the coal power plants back online uh, just to be able to meet uh, meet these demands. Uh, that's usually to the chagrin of a lot of the climate uh, climate activists. But at the same time, it's either that or you end up without power. Well, of course, they can always wear warmer coats, but that's not usually an acceptable solution. Definitely when, when temperatures plummet and you have a vulnerable population in some cases, right? So... Um, and on my final point here that I wanted to make, I would, this would be a little bit uh, more in-depth, is the fact that uh, France, for the most part, has a lot of uh, nuclear power. That fortunately, they were able to sell um, the electrical output of those plants to the rest of Europe. However, a lot of those plants uh, usually answer their maintenance cycle you know, on these parts of the year, and they're out for maintenance or refueling. So that, once again, limits the output they can, they can generate. But this is not for the winter. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, this is a warmer than usual uh, season. So, And then they've had a drier than usual season. So what impact does this have in the near term and for the rest of the year? Well, one problem that we're seeing is uh, water water levels in some of these rivers, right, with the Danube or the Rhine even, you know, they, they have record low levels. And of course, this this is um, also seen in some of the reservoirs for some of the hydroelectric power. How's this going to impact them coming into the spring and the summer, right? Well, it's already impacting them now because they don't have enough to, to, to run some of those like, hydroelectric dams uh, to the power level they need. But more importantly is as they come into the summer, this crisis is, is, is going to extend all the way through that summer season, namely but, uh, because of the fact that a, they don't have um, the adequate water levels for some of these reservoirs, but also for the nuclear fleet, you have um, this uh, warmer than usual water temperature in, in some of these rivers or bodies of water that they used for uh, cooling. 
So as the cooling temperature is not as is warmer than than than, it, than expected, the output of the plant is going to be slightly lower than than it's uh, normally uh, forecasted. So again, it's got another slight loss in the output of electricity for some of these generators. So um, this, of course, has, has brought up a lot of conversation, right, regarding what's happening with um, with our climate goals. Clearly, that's this proves to be quite a setback, uh, and it, it could be in, into the many years, perhaps a decade, you know, uh, uh, further than, than they had hoped. So again, another problem, right? Geopolitical crisis then again you know, leads to a climate crisis, or it'll exacerbate an existing climate crisis. But uh, many are saying that this is an opportunity to revisit and rethink how we are approaching this this whole um, energy and uh, treating it as a national security priority uh, no longer a climate or e economic uh, uh, well firstly it's an economic right, or infrastructure uh, um, asset but rather treat it as a national security asset both uh, in europe and in pretty much in every nation in the world right? for them uh, having adequate energy that's affordable and reliable is is uh, is not is of a na of a national security importance. So this is an example of that. So how do we achieve that? And I, I've I mentioned this before in previous episodes, right? Where it's like usually it's it's diversification, right? Don't rely so much on one type of fuel. Don't rely so much on renewables. Don't rely so much, uh, or don't rely exclusively on, on on one or two types of resources. Um, renewables are great, you know, and the battery storage is great but they on their own will not save the day um in fact in some cases they they are not as reliable as, as we had hoped you know and uh, to the fact that they tend to be a little bit more expensive than some of these conventional generating facilities so you know it's, it's great that we're adding them and it's great that we're uh deploying them as as uh as the the economics of it makes sense but to uh, rush ahead, rush full speed ahead at any cost is a very dangerous and um, un and unreliable place to put ourselves in, as we just saw what's happening now in Europe. So, uh, what are the some of the what are some of the solutions that we're looking at? And one example, for example, is and, and bringing it back here to the U.S. Right? Is is uh, right now Bill Gates is considering West Virginia to expand uh, some of its uh, nuclear energy efforts, right? And a lot of these are, of course, those small modular reactors. We're gonna see quite a few more of those pop up everywhere. And we're about maybe yeah, three, three to five years away until we begin to see what wide acceptance of this. So that is something that is coming. I think uh, Europe is going to have to change its attitude towards nuclear energy, especially the fact that you know here we're 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 really behind, and Europe has done a good job of um, keeping up with it with with uh, the technology and the challenges there. Uh, France has done a great job. In fact, France has is, is fully embraced nuclear energy, and 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 they're all the better for it in this particular instance, right? Germany probably will reverse some of those decisions when it came to nuclear energy, uh, much like, for example, California did, right? They had one power plant that were gonna shut down, the Elmo Canyon, and they reversed that. Uh, and uh, it, now, of course, it's a, it's a whole other challenger with government subsidies in the state to keep it running because it was no longer economically uh, beneficial for Pacific Gas and Electric to keep it online. So now they're being kept online thanks to uh, help from the state because simply there wasn't enough supply to justify taking it off. Right? So uh, examples like those, right, where, where they're considering different types of generating resources, right? The other interesting thing is that is that the small modular reactors, right, can also bring power to isolated communities. And uh, the need to build large transmission lines, transmission facilities, uh, may be a thing of the past, given the fact that now you can actually build, build a, one of these SMRs in a in a rural community and uh, have it be completely isolated without the need for all this huge infrastructure that goes into it so for them they can actually be the, on their own and reliable but also if anything happens to them they will not have a negative impact on the rest of the grid because they are indeed isolated um, eventually though as as these uh, different uh, small little communities with their small smrs begin to grow they will more, most likely become more interconnected and uh, complement and contribute to to the overall grids and maybe even go hand in hand with some of these uh, renewable projects that often find themselves in far off 
rural areas that are mostly uninhabited. Uh, for example, of those is in New Mexico, Arizona, some of the deserts of California, right? So that's an example of some, some, some of those regions like that that require a lot of transmission lines to get that power back. Whereas, you know, having an SMR somewhere, it just uh, meets that need right away and it's clean and it's, it's, it's fully modular. So as the fuel is uh, expended, uh, the whole the whole module can be extracted and then replaced with a new module, which is the size of a small shipping container. So this is something you may see throughout uh, not just the U.S., but you may start to see this throughout Europe. Uh, I know that China is working on this quite quite extensively. They've got like different nine different types of technology that they're currently working on in parallel. So it's, they're definitely ahead. I know that uh, Korea is has um, recently. Um, uh, working on the the nuclear reactors, both in uh, in the UAE, which is Dubai, and then of course they're gonna they're going to be the ones working in the nuclear reactor for Saudi Arabia, and there's more to come. So uh, they are, but those are the large scale reactors. Um, most likely, they will also get into the whole business of doing the smaller ones, and maybe even micro nuclear reactors in some cases. So. Um, Different options here. Uh, energy storage, of course, is 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 um, a huge importance right now. Uh, the problem is that with uh, some of the current technology, is they have a limited number of cycles, and the charge rate is much slower than the discharge rate. So in those cases, you know, they're still developing that. But some um, one of my previous shows, I had uh, somebody here from Energy Storage Systems uh, (ESS), where they have the uh, an iron iron salt water uh, battery system that seems to be pretty reliable and, uh, and sustainable and has thousands of cycles. So of course, when you're dealing with the utility, uh, size and weight is not an issue. You know, you can, can be as heavy as it, want, as it needs to be. It's not moving, it's just there to provide energy. So uh, the problem is they try to apply um, automotive or even, uh, or even electronic device battery technology to the utilities and that becomes extremely expensive. And mainly because of the fact that it's 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 a, it's a technology that was designed for to save space and weight, not really efficiency, right? In this case, so we should see, we should be seeing more of that as well. Now, when it comes to um, looking at changes, right? When we're looking at problems with uh, you know some of these issues, I mean, ga natural gas on its own has has had its supporters and detractors, right? I mean, here recently, we, we, we I mean, unrelated to, to the change in Europe, but here recently we had a challenge, right, to the fact that um, I'm sure that made the news where, where it's like a certain federal agency wanted to ban gas stoves. And uh, it's a good number of, uh, of households in the U.S., and I'm sure many households in Europe use natural gas stoves for cooking. Um, and the, and then, of course, a lot of, a lot of, uh, furnaces and heaters are also uh, fueled by natural gas. You know, so th that's an example, right? Where now it's like um, coming to the US, for example, the um, natural gas, of course, became a flashpoint for the culture wars once again, right? Trying to ban uh, a gas stove for the sake of cutting back on emissions, of course, sparked a whole new debate that, that of course, uh, forced that part of the government to back down. So this became quite, you know, a contentious issue. And in no doubt, I'm sure Europe is going to have, is going to face the same problem, right? Uh, at some point, they're going to try and ban gas-fired appliances, which, of course, we met with some severe um, opposition. Um, but uh, their their road towards complete electrification is moving a lot further ahead in this case, especially when it comes to uh, cooking and household appliances. But at the same time, you know, for them, it's it's uh, that'll be something that is um, looking again. The cost of energy in Europe is far more expensive per kilowatt hour compared to the U.S. in in general, or or the average cost. So that's another thing to consider. For example, um, they're asking these uh, consumers to give up inexpensive uh, appliances for, and then sw swap over to, to electric appliances that will, of course, you know, it's, it's the, the costs are huge. So the only way to make that happen really is to uh, provide uh, some kind of like subsidy or stipend to be able to get this done, uh, which is of course would be um, another issue that may or may not be sustainable given, given the hit they've had with this, um, crisis, that they, the, you know, this energy crisis they just face in Europe, and, they, and which are still facing, right? Now, one of the things that I remember, see myself here, um, I mean, I mean, and, and with, with everything else, right, you're looking at, uh, 
at prices. I mean, price of energy impacts the price of everything else, where it comes food, uh, transportation, of course, and, and all, all these other different commodities that we take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it, it gets expensive. Though. I mean, basically, a, a simple loaf of bread has now almost doubled in price, uh, especially in France. Right. One good example of that was they were talking about the baguette. Uh, the French baguette is now, for example, uh, uh, there are shortages for some periods of time. But now, of course, the price of that, you know, is um, is impacting, for example, uh, you know, these um, food distributors. And of course, the consumer itself, at the end of the day, you know, has has to buy food, which is usually prepared usually using energy from natural gas. So again, that has an impact. So as we can see that, you know, this crisis will be felt by your well into the 20, the middle of this year or towards the end of the year. Now going back to the uh, funding, right? Uh, the spiraling costs for securing energy supplies and cushioning consumers from price spikes, right? Uh, this is just an article from Bloomberg that I was reading. So, so, so Germany has al allocated 264 billion euros. That's 7.4 percent of the of the GDP. The UK has allocated 97 billion. That's 3.5 percent of their GDP. Italy has allocated 90. That's 5.1 percent. And France 69. That's 2.8 percent. The Netherlands is 43 billion, four, well, almost 44 billion, and that's 5 percent. And of course, Spain, um, last on the list, as uh, they've allocated 38 billion, and then of course, that's 3.2 percent. But you know, Germany was the one that was hit the hardest with this, right? And 7.4 percent of the GDP is quite a big percentage of, uh, of, uh, of subsidies, right? To be able to like absorb these energy spikes to keep it low for consumers. So again, this is not really sustainable, and it's really, really, uh, it's really stretching their fiscal capacity, right, through this rest of the year. So it's definitely something that we're concerned with, and um, going forward is something that I'm going to uh, probably report on again, uh, maybe in, the, in in a few more episodes. Um, how do we, as um, I guess, as consumers in the U.S., when it comes to energy, right? Well, it's it's a matter of understanding, right? Uh, knowing how the the grid works, knowing how the energy mixes work. Now, at uh, HSI's Industrial Skills Training. Uh, one of the skills we teach is uh, power system operations, whether it's for system operators, dispatching the grid, understanding reliability, and uh, and, and there we help train uh, operators, engineers, and even uh, planners to be able to prepare for these particular changes. Um, one of the things that we've seen, right, with legislators or even uh, policymakers a lot of times is that they, they don't understand the system they're affecting. Um, and, and usually some of this training becomes very beneficial to them to at least understand what a what an energy mix even means, what reliability even means. So again, I, I, I encourage you all to visit hsi.com and go into their industrial skills tab to learn more about the training we offer, uh, specifically on the, the power grid and, system, and training system operators as well. So. All right. Well, thank you. This is all I have for today. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all again in two weeks from now on the next episode. And um, if you have any questions, um, go ahead and uh, please add, add some of the comments and I'll try and get and respond to them as soon as I can. So thank you all and have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.